but don't forget that the the base of cyclocross is still in Flanders, and if you are going to push down where the success is, um, it might end up with uh, a, a total failure of uh, of the sport. Eh? Hello everyone and welcome back to the Cyclocross Social Podcast. Today we have another special episode, very highly requested one, one where we go into the changes in the World Cup and I have a very special guest joining me, three-time world champion Erwin Verwecke. Erwin, welcome on the show. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for being here. Could you maybe introduce yourself a bit to the listeners who don't know you, although I can't imagine that there are many. Well, I uh, I used to be a, a pro, a professional cyclocross rider. Um, starting, well, I started my career as a, as a very young rider uh, at the age of eight, and I've been a professional rider from 1995 till 2010, so 11 seasons. And I'm now retired from cycling, uh, not retired for for work, but uh, yeah, retired from cycling after my cycling career. And since uh, 2010, I'm working for Golazo. Golazo is the uh, yeah, one of the two big sports marketing companies in Belgium um, who organize uh, cyclocross events. So we are the organizer of the X2O Badkamers Trophy of the ATS Cross Series. And in the World Cup, we have the legs in Namur and in uh, Antwerpen um, that we organize ourselves. So uh, yeah, I'm pretty much into, into cyclocross. It's not my only project within Golazo, so we have more or less 20 cyclocross races a year, but I only do the sports technical side of it. So yeah, designing the courses, but that's not so much work. Uh, technical guide, all the contact with, uh, with the UCI, with, uh, with the Federation, with the commissaires, with the riders, uh, arranging start money for the non-World Cup events. But besides that, my main project is um, is I'm manager of the UCI Grand Fondo World Series, which is a UCI series of mass participation events. And the very new thing is, uh, and a new project I have is a, um, uh, this, a similar series, but then with gravel events. So it's called UCI Gravel World Series, which will be a cross, uh, would I say, uh, um, uh, a crossing between what cyclocross, mountain bike, and road racing is. So, well, we all know Strade Bianche and, and, and the many uh, alternative uh, events going over gravel roads. But the goal we have with the, with the UCI Gravel World Series is really um, mainly gravel um, events where yeah, 60, 70 percent is gravel, so not like Strade Bianche where we have 20, 30 percent gravel. So that's my new project, um, and that will take a lot of time in the next few months for me. Yeah, that definitely sounds exciting. That new gravel project. For now, we are going to focus a bit on the cyclocross part. Yeah. Every time that we are speaking about the World Cup this season, there's always like we always come towards the changes in the World Cup. I'll briefly summarize them. The World Cup was planned to be extended from roughly 8 races to 16 races last year. That didn't happen because of the pandemic. It got implemented this year. The amount of races got doubled. They're now almost all on a Sunday. And, well, I can imagine that that some people think it's good and some people think it's bad news for the sport. What would you think? Well, there's uh, for sure a, a good and a bad component about it. The good thing is uh, what the UCR wants to achieve with the internationalization of the of the sport. So we are now have three World Cups in the States. Uh, there's uh, two legs in, in France, one in Italy, uh, one in the Czech Republic, uh, a bunch of them in Belgium, uh, and also two in Holland, if I'm correct. Uh, Hulst and uh, Hogerad, or is there a Yeah, and Rukve also got that. Ah, yeah, Rukve, yes, uh, I forgot about that one. Um, so it's, it's, it's for sure better to promote cyclocross worldwide. The sport has mainly been popular in, uh, in the past years in Belgium and Holland and over the years also Czech Republic, France a bit, uh, when I was a very young rider in Switzerland. So to go back to those times, it's important to go further away and also promote the sport in the States. Uh, I think for the States, it's, it's a good idea. Now, on the other hand, um, it's it's for the riders, um, especially the the the, the men, uh, the, the top stars. Uh, 
Uh, well, also the women, uh, they have to make much more expenses. There is a tradition in cyclocross that riders, especially the top stars, getting paid start money. Uh, it's not the case in the World Cup, but they get more prize money. But yeah, what we see now is that for the for the top stars, yeah, they have to make more expenses traveling and make less money, especially the, the, the men. Women in general, uh, let's say that they benefit from it financially. And that's also one of the things I notice now, because of course now I'm on the side of the organizers, that the, the sports technical cost of the new World Cup has increased a lot. Uh, so if you take into account a race like Koppenberg this weekend or Rudervoorde the past weekend or uh, other big races, uh, Gavre, Diegem, um, uh, Super Pessis or X2O Trophy, the sports technical cost, which is the sum of um, prize money, start money in, in the private races, their start money, and the race license, which you have to pay to the Federation and in the World Cup also to Flanders Classics. Uh, well, the World Cup, the price ticket of a World Cup is, is double than uh, a race in a Super Prestige or X2O trophy. And that's, of course, on top of the logistics, uh, which remain the same. Yeah, a very financially hard thing to, to, to make it break even as an organizer. And uh, we've seen many different organizers in the past in Italy, also in France, but mainly in Italy. Yeah. I've been a pro rider for 16 seasons and since 10 years I'm also on the organizer side and I've seen at least 15 different locations in Italy, for instance, for a World Cup and this year it is in Val di Sole. But the chance is rather high that uh, it will be a one shot, same like we had, like uh, I've raced in in Bergamo, or in Torino, in uh, in in Milano. Well, that was maybe on two occasions, two times in Rome. Um, there was the the World Cup where Ton Arts broke his collarbone three four years ago, um, and they were all one shots. And that's a bit of pity because uh, yeah, we want to create classics. So yeah, that's the downside of the down yeah, side of the of, of the new World Cup that is very expensive for organizers. And all, another thing is uh, I'm, I'm working for uh, for uh, yeah, one of the main organizers. Yeah, um, let's say the traditional races and I'm also taking into account uh, our colleagues at the Super Besties who were traditionally on, 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 a, on a very good Sunday in November, December, attracting a lot of people. Yeah, they have lost their preferred date. Huh? Deegan, for instance, was for 40 years uh, on the Sunday in between uh, Christmas and New Year. They have now been, I wouldn't say devaluated, but uh, they had to move to a what is it this year? A Wednesday at uh, at least a midweek day. So for them, it's uh, it's it's yeah less income, less spectators on television, which is a pity for the tradition. Uh, same for the racing. Javre now had to move to February after the World Championships. We also had a few races like that who were on a, on a traditional Sunday for many years, and we now have to move to a Saturday. Yeah, and that's only the races that actually go through in a sustainable way. Because if we look back, you already mentioned in Italy, there are some races that were held one time. But if we look back a couple of years ago, we went to Germany, to Zeven, and riders are still waiting for their prize money of that second edition. First edition wasn't a huge success either. So would you then say that there really should be maybe a stricter selection criteria for when races get added to the calendar that they are sustainable and that they will be held for let's say five years and then that they will be held like with proper funding as well yeah well it's 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 a it's a hard one because it's a, it's it's a lot of extra budget which you need to have as an organizer and 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 then going to countries like italy and france where of course the good thing is you promote cyclocos in those countries but um, yeah, on the long term, it would be better to have like a, a, a an organizer was remaining in the series for many years, uh, like we had, for instance, with Igor in, in Spain uh, for many years. We had Nome and Ponchateau in France, but in the new World Cup, they yeah they they disappeared. Igor also already disappeared a few, a few years ago. But um, I don't know the local situation. I know the organizers, but not like uh, personally uh, to know what the financial consequences are and where they get their money from. Is it from sponsoring? Is it from the region? Is it from uh, 
the city yeah, will, will spend uh, money and fundings for the organization. But what we see is that, yeah, apart from Tabor, for instance, which is a, a long term World Cup and World Championships organizer, many of those events just are a, a one shot. We also had a, a one shot in the, in, in the UK once. Uh, in don't remember the, 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 the city, but uh, yeah, a one time World Cup. The, the ones in the States are OK. So the, the one in Iowa and Waterloo, but they have, uh, yeah, a, another business model. Iowa depends on a lot of masters participations will pay, I don't know, maybe 50 or a $100 to participate. And with that money, yeah, the organizer can pay for the for the elite World Cup. The one in Waterloo is from Trek and uh, well, I guess it's in their sponsor budget uh, to promote the bike brand. So those are, let's say, sustainable organizers. Uh, not sure about Fayette Phil for the upcoming years. We'll see about that next year. But it's 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 financially difficult, yeah. Yeah, even for Iowa, Iowa wasn't on the calendar for last year because they couldn't bring up the budget. Well, I, I think it was mainly because of the pandemic and the impossibility to travel to the States for the Europeans. Yeah, but that's why Waterloo got taken off. But on the original calendar for the 2020-2021 season, Waterloo was the only American World Cup because okay. Iowa was around $80,000 short in terms of budget. And... Now, eventually they sorted it for this year that was always their plan what they announced but it just shows that even sustainable races like iowa have troubles yeah well but it, it is a, a difficult budget um I, i'm totally in, in favor of having gender equality in in terms of price money so um women and men should be paid equal huh? that's that's for sure that's also in in, in races like uh, koppenberg now on monday or or yeah, the big super prestige races, uh, uh, it's in the, in the UCI regulations. But because the prize money in the, in the World Cup is uh, more than 80,000 euros compared to, to the very low, uh, well, uh, 10,000 euro, let's say, for men and women elite, uh, for instance, on the Koppenberg, uh, yeah, it, it's a big change. And uh, it is very hard to, to, to find that money now. People, the, the top stars get paid prize money, uh, no start money in, in, in races like Koppenberg where they don't pay uh, start money in, in World Cups. So they get a, a, a compensation on that side and, and, and even the best riders get paid more in, uh, in, in, in the, let's say, the private rankings, eh? the, the non-World Cup rankings. Yeah, I don't know. Um, it's, it's, it's a difficult financial situation for most organizers and we'll see how that turns out in a few years it's definitely complicated especially considering that i think the world cup takes up like i think it's something like 75 percent of the sponsor slots on terms of banners and things no well you have uh, you had the option last year uh to to buy a fifty thousand license fifty thousand euro license fee in return for fifty percent marketing rights so 50 percent for the world cup organizers and 50 percent for the for the local organizers or pay a 35,000 euro license fee and then you get i'm not 100 percent sure i think 75 percent is then for the world cup and 25 percent local but i don't know if that is still uh, the case this season because most organizers just pay for the 50 percent marketing rights it's basically the same as what I read. So I guess that's still the case. Yeah, that's still the case. So the 50% in, in return for 50,000 euro, that's, uh, yeah, that's in the official guides. And that's something that can be consulted uh, on, on the UCI website. But overall, the plan of the World Cup is to try and professionalize the sport. But it looks to be coming at a cost. This weekend, we had the World Cup in Zonhoven. It was supposed to be organized by Golazzo, but they couldn't get together the big budget because it was announced that they had needed to have a budget of between 350,000 and 400,000 euros, which is really a lot. It made a loss of between 60 and 80,000 euros at least is what was published on Wielerflitz this week. So would you then say that the professionalization of the sport is maybe going too fast so that it's almost impossible for organizers of a relatively young classic Zonhoven to keep up with the with the rapid pace of changes well the the income for an organizer comes from ticketing yeah so the public 
comes from sponsors and comes from FIP sales and uh, from fundings from a region or a city. Now the, 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 the partners uh, which you can uh, contact and contract are limited to 50%. So you can't yeah, have like a full course of, uh, of your own partners. So the amount there is, 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 is determined and uh, well, the, the, the rates that partners pay are more or less set all over the, the different series. Uh, if you sponsor in uh, in the X2O Bad Kamers Trophy, if you sponsor Super Pesties or World Cup, well, the rates of, of sponsoring of, uh, let's say, 150 meter of bannering in TV view are more or less the same. So that's more or less a, a determined amount of, 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 of money. The second one is VIP sales. Uh, of course, there you can make a big difference. Then the third one is the fundings. And well, the, the other two World Cups we organized, uh, we were planning to organize, or we pl we, we, we still organize, uh, is Namur and is uh, Antwerpen. Well, Namur is the capital city of Wallonia. Antwerpen is the second biggest city in Flanders. So there's a bigger budget from the city uh, to promote the event and to, to, yeah, to, to fund it. Uh, Sonnenhoven is, of course, a smaller town with only 20,000 people. They don't have the budget like Antwerp and, uh, and Namur, so for them it's very hard to, 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 to bring up the money. Uh, and then ticketing is also more or less defined. Um, you won't bring in double the amount of, uh, of people because it's a World Cup. Uh, we've seen this this past Sunday in, uh, in, in, in Zonhoven. Well, it's, it wasn't a big crowd that we saw five, six years ago. Eh? Um, it depends, of course, also on the weather. Um, but that's always a risk. Um, and yeah, it, you won't make a big uh, difference there. It's mainly partners and, and, and fundings who, who can make the difference. Yeah, it looks like the spectator numbers this year are relatively low compared to earlier years. Although I did read that, um, I sorry, I, sorry, I forgot his name, but he also works for Colazzo. He gave an interview with the Belgian journal yesterday and he said that it, uh, yes, it was lower, but it wasn't that bad. There's more VIPs for the Koppenberg than for the Koppenberg in 2019, which I think is very encouraging news. Yeah. But eventually, it looks to be the case that as soon as Van der Poel, Van der Aert, and to some extent Pitcock come into the field, that they really get the big, big crowd to come towards the cross. Yeah, I, I've been racing... Um from 1995 till 2010 and I've seen it evolve. Uh, uh, let's say in 1995 you had like, uh, um, you were happy with 2000, 2000 spectators um, and then it got to a, a, a very high point. I think by the end of my career and by the end, uh, especially in the last three, four years when, when Sven Ness uh, was at his top. So let's say between 2010 and 2015 was was for sure the absolute top of spectators. It didn't really go down at, uh, at, at uh, the Christmas period or let's say at the peak of the season. But what we've seen is that um, the, the, the early season, September uh, and, and early October, have always been difficult. There's still the road uh, world championships in the past two years. We've all also seen uh, Tour of Flanders, uh, Paris-Roubaix this year, uh, then the World Cups in the States. Um, so the numbers, are, are, have always been down in the last four or five years uh, in the early season. But from more or less around this time of the year, uh, Koppenberg, uh, Rudervoorde, that's the real start of the season. And then you can you see people showing up um, when it's getting colder, when they have to take their winter jackets and be with boots uh, in the mud. So yeah, the Christmas period is, has, has, has always been the same in the past years. Uh, it's only the start of the season, which is a bit more difficult. But yeah, as, as, as Christophe, eh, that's probably the one you, you refer to, Christophe Impus, uh, which is our managing director. Um, yeah, FIP sales are still going very well. Uh, Koppenberg, well, it depends a bit on the weather we can expect on Monday, but I guess numbers will be very good. Um, and then when Wout and Mathieu show up, uh, of course, the, the numbers will, will, will still increase because they are the most appealing riders for, uh, for the big crowd. But don't you think then if the 
the World Cup wants to present itself as the Champions League of cyclocross, that they should maybe relook their calendar and come to the conclusion that 16 races is too much because the Champions League always want to have all the best riders at the start. So should they maybe reduce the amount of races and have a relatively later start and then move more towards a calendar similar as the World Cup mountain biking has so that they can be sure that the best riders ride the most important classification. Yeah, well, it's of course, um, Wout and Mathieu are, are, have grown above the cyclocross level. Huh? They are world stars. Uh, and if tomorrow they do mountain bike or trek or whatever other discipline, they will probably also remain top stars. Huh? Well, Van der Poel has already proven on, on mountain bike. Um, so yeah, f- for sure. It, it'll make a difference. You always have the discussion now, eh? um, if, even if we we see that we have very close battles, and especially in the women's category, we have from the early season, um, all the top stars there. Um, and even if we see very beautiful races where when Van der Poel is there, it's often already decided after one or two laps. Uh, still, we see that, yeah, they attract a lot of people. Yeah, they are important for cyclocross. Uh, so, well, would it be better to have a, a, a shorter calendar? I think it will be more healthy um, because now you have uh, yeah the, the, the traditional organizers who have been there uh, for 20, 30, 40, 50 years organizing every weekend on their same date and they have lost uh, confidence in in, in remaining or uh, retaining that date. Uh, it's, it's, it's not so easy for them. Um, so, yeah, I fear that a few of them will just have enough of it and, 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 and after 40 years uh, decide not, not, to, not to continue. And that would be re- really a pity for the division of the cyclocross. So, in my opinion, it would be better to have a, a shorter defined World Cup around New Year. Yes, for sure. And how international should that be? So, NICE has offered the idea of having 10 crosses in 10 different countries. My biggest issue with that would be is if you go to the United States, there has to be more than one race at least to make the trip affordable. But should it be something like that, like when you started racing in 95, 96, when you had seven or eight crosses in the same amount of countries? Yeah, I, I used to race when there were uh, six, seven, eight World Cups in in, in, in a few different countries. Um, and what was that period better? I don't know. Um, for sure now, yeah, the top stars have, have, have earned a lot of money in the last years because there's a big competition. And in Belgium, the business model of cyclocross has been very good over the past years. But of course, also the costs of, of, of those organizations have gone up a lot. And um, yeah, it's uh, it's very hard as an organizer to, to make your event break even. Um, I don't have to tell you that. So would it be better to have one World Cup per country um, and, and a, a shorter World Cup? Well, what we saw last year because of the pandemic is that we only had five World Cups. And in the end, what Van Aert won it, uh, which is better for the image, I think, than, than this year. And I, I don't mean to underestimate uh, Eli Isabit or Ton Hartz or whoever is going to win. But journalists and spectators will always say, well, yes, but... Wout van Aert, Mathieu van der Poel and Tom Pitcock were not there. So it's, uh, yeah, in my opinion, yeah, it would be better to, to, to combine them in a shorter period around Christmas. That's for sure. Yeah, I think part of it, what you said, has to do with the way that Iserbeet and Arts are being marketed in a way. It's not only the event that sells or gets people there and sells tickets. It's also the people who ride there that get people there. Because if you look, Van der Poel and Van Aert and Pitcock is rapidly storming up the ranks as well. These are the superstars. They're not only good in um, ra- racing bikes. If you look beside the bike, they are they have their own brand, and that also gets people. They will want to they want to know what Van Aert does when he's not yeah. riding a bike. They are interested in who he is and what he does, and that also gets people to the events and if you want a perfect example you could see the effect of drive to survive in uh, the united states the race there was sold out for the first time ever 385,000 spectators simply because they now have the rivalry of course the season is very good in f1 but 
the drive to survive has also given people an insight in okay who is AD easy beat and who is tone art and we saw that a couple of seasons ago with the program cone prince on tv on tv it really gave us an insight in the life of out van art and macho van der poel and that has happened in a less extent with easy beat and art so yeah of course it's easy beat and art but we don't really know a lot about them and we, what we do know is that usually they are there in the early season and they're very good riders, but they are up against two of the best riders ever, Van der Poel and Van Aert, and these days as well like up against Pitcock, and they usually get defeated by them, so that always will put them just below them until they can make the step, in my opinion, that they can consistently compete with them. Yeah, well, it is, it is as you mentioned, eh? uh, Wout van Aert, Mathieu van der Poel, and also Tom Pitcock in the last year, eh? winning the Olympics mountain bike and winning, uh, what does he won, uh, uh, the Brabant Sapel and almost Amstel Gold Race and, and so many other events. Uh, they are the real, real top stars, but especially Wout and Mathieu, yeah, winning, winning all those big races, uh, it made them real top stars. And with social media, with, uh, with uh, the changes, uh, uh, um, in the media landscape, uh, of course, it's 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 a totally different approach. When I was racing, there was no social media. People had to come to the race to 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 see the riders from nearby and to touch them. And there was, well, when I was running, we started with a with a, with a program. Huh? We were followed by by cameras for uh, two or three seasons, uh, but it was like step by step, um, and it has developed and. Yeah, it is a bit on arts, uh, Lauren Zweig, uh, Quinton Hermans, Michael Van Turno, they are also very good riders, but not the level of, of, of the real top stars. And well, can we blame them? Uh, no, of course not. I, I've um, yeah, experienced the same. We, uh, in my time, there was finesse and, and yeah, I was, I was of a lower level, but sometimes I could beat him and uh, yeah, at this moment, it seems quite impossible for for Elisabeth and Ton Arts to beat them, uh, especially not in the big moments uh, to beat uh, what uh, Mathieu van der Poel at, at the World Championships, for instance, because that could make a difference. But this is only, at, at least until now, I only focused on the men's side, but there were complaints about the spectator numbers for the World Cups in the States. But I wonder, what has the World Cup done to get people in the United States to know that there is a World Cup and not just a World Cup. In the women's category, all the best riders of the world were there. Mariana Vos, who is, in my opinion, without a doubt, the best cyclist all times yeah. in the women's category, was there. She was joined by Lucinda Brandt, who was a world champion. Yolanda Neff, Olympic champion mountain bike, was there. Um, we would have had the world champion short track mountain bike Blevins there in the men's category. but. I hadn't seen anything from the World Cup actively promoting it in Madison or in Iowa City or in Chicago that if you stay there and about an hour away from the race site that you're going to miss out and in that way you will never really attract casual people to go and watch if they don't know that they are missing out on something very special, special athletes. No, well, yeah, a good point. Um, there is still uh, a lot to do in promotion. Of course, promotion also costs a lot of money and the business model of cyclocross is already under pressure. So, yeah, it is, uh, it's hard to, to, to say. Maybe if tomorrow there is a big international top star uh, being born in the States, that it will make a difference. But so far, yeah, it's um, it's 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 also a matter of personality uh, in the women's category. You indeed have uh, Marianne Vos, who is a big personality and a big top star in, in, in cycling. Lucinda Brandt is, uh, yeah, all the rest is there, uh, as you mentioned. Uh, Yolanda Neef is an Olympic champion, uh, but still, yeah, the crowd didn't come to the races. Uh, maybe Arkansas was too far away from where cyclocross is really living in the, in the States. Uh, I've been racing in the States also on a number of occasions and from what I heard at that time, uh, the, the main focus on cyclocross in the States is on, uh, in, in, in New England at that time. Huh? So I don't know, uh, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, uh, those, those states uh, above New York, the Boston area there. Um, and, and now they are more focused in between the big lakes. Um, I don't know if there are many spectators there um, or many participants because the spectators are usually also the participants in the masters categories. 
uh, and that's the success of, for instance, Iowa. But even there, we saw, uh, yeah, less spectators than than in previous years. So I don't know. Um, it's, it's something to consider. It's something to evaluate for the upcoming seasons to know where we have to go to f with with cyclocross. Would there maybe also be a market for Golazzo to organize these foreign World Cup runs that we are talking about, perhaps in the UK? Well, we have considered to have a, a World Cup in the UK. We have a, an office in the UK who is organizing a big Grand Fondo, uh, Tour of Cambridge, uh, which is the biggest Grand Fondo in the, in the UK. Now, there has been talks to organize a, a World Cup in, in the UK. But for some reason, yeah, then the World Cup came up, the new format of the World Cup, and uh, the, the British Federation has been in touch with uh, with uh, Flanders Classic. So uh, for some reason, it hasn't ended uh, with, with the World Cup in, uh, in, in the UK so far. Because I think there's a big market. You have Tom Pitcock, you have a, a few British riders, eh? uh, also a few women. Uh, Anna Kay at this moment, but before you, we also had uh, Alan Wyman and uh, and, and uh, Nikki uh, Bremer. Huh? Uh, they were also the top stars. They retired now from cycling, but I'm sure it's it's pretty nearby if you can do it uh, in the London area. Um, it could be a success, but of course, London area is also very expensive. Huh? In Belgium, you have uh, the volunteers, and every club has a lot of volunteers who work for free and. Um, yeah, uh, there's a lot of know-how, there's a lot of experience. There you have to uh, outsource everything and hire contractors, and so it becomes much more expensive. Yeah, I think the internationalization, in my opinion, is good. I think that if the sport really wants to grow further upon being seen as a Belgian sport for the people, then it will need to move outside Belgium. And perhaps that means some races need to go in Belgium, but I think overall there needs to be finding a better way than having a double weekend Kortrijk Tabor. This year it's Kortrijk Besançon. And Jens Decker, he came up with a pretty interesting idea, in my opinion. He said the World Cup should maybe cut to 8 or 10 crosses, or if they really want to 616, implement like some double weekends when like when you're going to Tabor and Munich wants to come on the calendar put them together the travel between that is okay and then surround these World Cup races kind of like having the World Cup as the world tour of road cycling and then have these races surrounded by like a kind of pro series as you now have in cycling the day before or around it so that the riders when they make the trip they can race there if there's an organizer there that has the money, like you can see in the United States where Jingle Cross is three days, but you can have like kind of more of an event around it, which should make it more sustainable for the riders to like earn back their costs without these starting fees. Yeah, but we forget one thing is that uh, sports is so big in Belgium um, and, and the, the partners who are interested to, 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 yeah, to promote their products and their, uh, their business via cyclocross they live in belgium uh, they are often flemish companies who like to invite their clients in cyclocross races and if there is a race weekend tabor munich uh, well these clients won't be invited to tabor or munich because it's a long trip or well maybe there is a a number of them wanting to make the trip but but not like every week so um i've been part of the cyclocross commission and there has been many suggestions on how should we make it more international, but don't forget that the, the base of cyclocross is still in Flanders and if you are going to push down where the success is, um, it might end up with uh, a, a total failure of, uh, of the sport. Eh? Um, we don't have to uh, yeah, put pressure on the existing success and, and try to implement it in other countries. We can do it step by step, but uh, yeah the base of cyclocross, the fan base and the base of uh, VIP sales and the base of, 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 of the, the interested partners to, to promote their products via cyclocross, that's still mainly in Flanders. Yeah, so it would perhaps first require like an international sponsor like Red Bull or like Walmart, which is now becoming the title sponsor of the World Championships to really get involved before it would be sustainable to like spread the success of cyclocross to other countries. Yeah, that that could work. Yeah, that could work. But uh, it's it's very hard to find. Um, I don't know if uh, if if an international brand is interested to 
promote it uh, in, in races like, uh, yeah, I don't know, the, the French and the new Italian World Cup and, and races like seven, where you see less spectators and probably also less uh, viewers on television. Yeah, a final point that I think would be a big step forward is if cyclocross could finally become an Olympic sport. I know there's been a lot of lobbying for that. If that would happen, then I think there would be a rise in not only interest by riders who now do a bit of cyclocross, like Fantorini, like Flukiger. I think those would now stay in the sport, and as well as Evie Richards, because a gold medal at the Olympics is something special. And I would think that as soon as that would happen, that there will immediately also be an interest in terms of sponsors and also funding by national federations in countries that we don't expect at the moment. Yeah, that could be a, 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 yeah, a solution. But I remember those discussions from 25 years ago. So um, hopefully one day we can succeed, succeed with that. Uh, but but it's, a, it's a hard struggle. I, I see often uh, a lot of... Yeah, what I call side sports being becoming Olympic, uh, where I doubt, okay, who is waiting for that? Maybe that's my opinion, but uh, cyclocross is it's a very attractive sport. It's a, it's a, it's a sport who can, yeah, who is perfect for television. So in my opinion, it would be a perfect Olympic sport. The big discussion is, yeah, do we have to put it in the summer or the winter Olympics? Huh? Winter Olympics, then it has to be on snow and ice. And that's also one of the reasons why they are going to Val de Sol this season. But it's a, yeah, it's a discussion that is already lasting for 30 years. Well, Ervin, thank you for your input on the new World Cup, considering the time. Uh, I think we should wrap up. I have uh, one question from a listener, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, of course. Well, one of our listeners has a question which is uh, not entirely related to the World Cup. He has a question relating to your career. He asked, why were you always so good at the World Championships? Did you profit from the attention that Nice and Valens got? Uh, well, those are two questions. So why was I always so good at the World Championships? Um, well, for some reason, I liked big events. I liked um, having a lot of pressure. I could also handle a lot of pressure. and. Um, it's not that I came out of the blue. Huh? I was always, uh, I've never been world champion when not being in the top three of the UCI ranking. So I was always uh, there, but yeah, usually it was Finesse leading the full season. And then at the world championships, he was, uh, he could be beaten. Uh, we knew that uh, he was somebody, especially the young Finesse was somebody who was, uh, yeah, uh, often not at his best at the world championships. Uh, and I was. So, yeah, for some reason, I, I liked it. I liked uh, the atmosphere of the World Championships. I really kicked on, 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 on the adrenaline. And that made me always very good. I was always an outsider. And, and when the number one or the number two were failing, uh, I was there to take over. Second question was, um, did I benefit from the attention of Sven and, and, and Bart? Uh, yes, for sure. It uh, was the time that we had Wellens and we had so the, the reality show uh, around Bart Wellens and it was very popular and I'm sure that I also benefited a, a bit from, from that period. Um, it made Cross very popular in those days. I, I, I remember those times that uh, yeah, we went all of a sudden from well-known sporters to, to uh, famous uh, Flemish people and, and we were recognized much more in, in those days. Um, and, and for sure also Sven. Sven was the icon who won a lot, who, who uh, yeah, was getting more and more popular towards the end of his career, um, especially in the last two, three seasons. Uh, Sven was super popular because he was not the one winning everything anymore. Huh? There were the young guys, uh, Wout van Aert and Mathieu van der Poel, slowly taking over. Or not slowly, because all of a sudden they were there. Uh, but uh, anyway, it made him very popular and it made the sport very popular. And um, yeah, that's also one of the reasons why I probably could stay uh, at Colazzo to work for cyclocross. Um, and a lot of people benefit from that period. So uh, let's not forget about that. Well, Erwin, thank you so much for wanting to come on and for your time. Okay, it's been a pleasure. So uh, thanks also for the invite.
Then some information for our listeners to finish off this episode with. Tomorrow on Thursday we will be, re- be releasing our European Championships preview podcast with former world champion in the juniors category Jens Decker. And then of course this weekend double podcast for the European Championships held on the Vanberg. Once again thank Erwin for joining us today. I thank all of you for listening. Make sure to share this with your cyclocross friends. And then we will catch you guys tomorrow in our European Championships preview. See you then. Goodbye.